Hello, everybody. Glad to have you with us today again for our Berean Bible study. I am your host, Granville McKenzie, and God is great and greatly to be praised. So uh, let's start tonight with prayer as we prepare our hearts to uh, dig into the Word of God and just enjoy what He has for us today. And Lord, we bless you, we thank you, we worship you, we glorify you truly. You have been good to us, and we appreciate everything you do, all you are to us, and the way you have opened your word to us. And tonight, as we gather together, I pray that you will just help us to devote ourselves to you, to open ourselves to receive you, and that we will learn and grow as you lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. So we bless you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, we covered uh, a bunch of ground uh, last time, and we have come now to Exodus chapter 12. And I certainly will pause for a moment in case there is anything you'd like to bring up from uh, last time, uh, just just in case, I want to make sure I don't um, deny you that opportunity. And in the meantime, uh, please turn to Exodus chapter 12. That's where we will launch tonight. And along with that, please take a look at the chat. Um, coming up first week in uh, October, we will be switching to a new login ID. And so it's listed there for those of you who like to log in that way. And of course, if not, you just simply go to the Face Sanctuary website and you will see the button that says to join Berean Bible Study. Click here and that's a quick, easy link that you can use. I will uh, make this announcement another time, but come October, we will just uh, jump in on the, on the new line. So um, uh, we won't be there till then, so just make a note of that. But uh, first uh, Monday in October, we will be using the new login, as you see in the chat. And uh, of course, just go to the website, as I mentioned, and that's a quick, easy way, nothing to remember, nothing to do. Just click here and you'll be in. So I don't see any hands raised right now as far as our last lesson is concerned, so we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, and um, although we might not do a lot of chapters, we have come to a chapter that is tremendously significant as far as uh, just so much of what has happened from that time forward, and so we are in uh, Exodus chapter 12 says, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Um, now, some of you may have done some uh, reading ahead and understand that we basically have two uh, different calendars that Israel uses. One is like a secular calendar, and one is a religious calendar calendar. So here in the springtime uh, is the beginning of the religious calendar and uh, the month uh, Nisan. And so we, we have, uh, have this new time beginning based on the wonderful things that um, God was about to do as far as their deliverance was concerned. And so so we have um, this being the beginning of months. Verse 3, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the 10th of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. And um, as we go through, I'll just stop to mention some of the things certainly that are foreshadowed here that we will see come to fruition later on. 
uh, this is one of those spots where we see this lamb being taken. And if you jump forward to John chapter 1 and verse 29, uh, another scripture you are very familiar with, and this is... Um, and this chapter 12 of Exodus has a lot of bearing on so many other scriptures that we will read. So if we just quickly take a look at John 1.29, you see it says the next day, uh, speaking of John the Baptist uh, near Bethany, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'll just read that particular verse and, and just state that all the way back here, we see this lamb coming into the picture for the first time. And, and we, yes, sacrifices had been made before, but now we see a special significance that is, is going to take place here. So this is the lamb, uh, take a lamb for themselves, for their father's household, a lamb for each household. Verse 4, if the household is too small uh, for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And so with this particular lamb, again, prefiguring Christ, it was to be an unblemished male, a year old. Now, I don't know how lamb years uh, correlate with uh, human years, but uh, certainly Jesus was young at 30 years old, 33 years old when he was crucified. So he was an unblemished male, sinless, and of a young age. Verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And so, again, as we have seen with so many of the plagues, this one gives an even longer lead time in that uh, they were to get this lamb on the 10th. The Egyptians, again, would see what's going on and understand from what we read in chapter 11 that God was about to bring this last great final judgment on Egypt. And if someone wanted to join in, well, they had warning. They had time. They could get a lamb. They could do uh, what they wanted to do if they believed in, in the God of Israel if they believe now at this time i know there's a lot of symbolism we're yet to jump into but but as an act of faith any of these egyptians who would get a lamb and follow the instructions you just have to say well they would have the same result as israel had uh, verse seven moreover they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And so uh, the first part of this, um, you, you have the lamb being killed, uh, and the second part you have the blood being taken and and put on the the doorposts and on the lintel of the house, uh, you you have them roasting this lamb and and this lamb is going to be eaten uh, that same night. In fact, later on we we read that that it's it's not to be kept at all to the next day. If if so, just uh, burn what's left over. And, and so they are to eat this lamb now with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So again, just to throw a couple of other scriptures in that are relevant to what we are talking about, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 
verse 8. If you'd like to flip over to that scripture, 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Uh, some of these things, as you know, just sort of jump in in various places as the New Testament writers just pull what they need from the Old Testament. Here it says, Therefore let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he, he says, let's celebrate the feast. And this, of course, was the, the first and the big feast that, that he would be referring to, even though this was a, a Gentile audience. Clearly, they had an understanding of what he was talking about. And so he's saying, let's celebrate the feast, but not with old leaven. So here uh, is a New Testament verse that gives us an idea of the symbolism of leaven. He says, there is a leaven that uh, I, he, he refers to as the leaven of malice and wickedness. And, and from that, we really start to get uh, the thought process of leaven uh, being something that typifies sin. So when we are before the Lord eating this feast, we don't want to come with malice. We don't come with wickedness. And many times when we are taking communion, for example, I think of, of this verse and think of the whole concept that we come together as the people of God and we come without malice. We come without wrath. We come without any animosity and factionalism and all of that. We're all eating the same bread and drinking the same cup, and we need to do this without the leaven of malice and wickedness. But he says, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So it's, it's a contrast being given to us. Don't do it one way, do it the other way. And so if we sort of take that back into the Old Testament, certainly they didn't have 1 Corinthians to read as a reference scripture, but, but they were meant to follow God's directions precisely, and, and this was a part of it. You're going to eat uh, with unleavened bread, and you're going to eat with bitter herbs. And for that, you can just go back to Exodus chapter 1, and uh, verse 14, and that just tells us, Exodus 1, 14, um, they made the Egyptians, in verse 13, compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and at all kinds of labor in the field, all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. So uh, this bitterness of labor, of slavery, of all they went through was in their minds as they consumed these bitter herbs in this, this particular feast. So you have the lamb, you have the unleavened bread, and you have the bitter herbs, and all of these things represent something certainly concerning Christ and concerning the way we should live. Uh, verse 9, don't eat any of it raw or boiled with water, but roasted with fire, head, legs, entrails, the whole thing is going to be roasted, and, and you, you don't leave any in, until the morning. Uh, whatever is left until morning, you shall burn with fire. So this is a sacrifice that's going to be consumed entirely, uh, either uh, you know, the parts that are eaten by the worshipers and whatever was left over was to be burned with fire. It was not to be used for any other purpose. And, and so that's, that's the Lord's Passover um, in verse 11. And then he informs them, I will go through 
the land of Egypt on that night, I'm in verse 12, will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. So this is the ultimate, um, the ultimate of, of, of God's judgment against everything that Egypt represents. And, and he says, as he said way back, as you recall, uh, even before the first meeting that uh, Moses had with Pharaoh, God had said, look, uh, he won't let you go until it comes to this point that I take his firstborn. And then in the first meeting that Moses and Aaron had with Pharaoh, he repeated that to Pharaoh to say, Israel is my firstborn. We talked about that a couple of weeks back. Israel is my firstborn. And if you don't let him go, I'm going to take your firstborn. And so now it comes to that final point. Um, I'm going to go through Egypt uh, at night. And verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so it certainly seems to me that even without the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs and you know the eating and preparation to leave, it seems that there's just a direct correlation between the killing of the lamb, taking its blood, putting it on the the uh, doorposts and on the lintel. And uh, from this verse, I just take it to mean that if the Egyptians, any Egyptian, had even followed that much, they would have been spared the death of their firstborn. And, and so uh, this, this was the beginning of God's instruction to Israel with regard to the Passover. So let me Pause for a moment if there's uh, anything that you would like to chat about uh, as far as the first 13 verses are concerned. Okay, I don't see anybody with a hand up, so let's continue. So I'm at... Uh, verse 14, Exodus 12, verse 14. Now this day will be a memorial for you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. So this now was, was the first of, of months, uh, again, as their religious calendar was concerned, and you're going to do this perpetually. You just do this until. So this is a very, very serious, very important feast. And of course, when we correlate it with Jesus, we understand that this is something for all time. Uh, verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, you shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. Uh, so, uh, now, I, oh yes, I, I did uh, touch on the significance of the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. I just had a moment of senior moment there. I was just wondering, did I read both those scriptures? Yes, I did. So now you have this, this week-long feast, 
And of course, seven in scripture is always a day, a number of completion, of perfection. Seven uh, has that, you know, certainly starting with the seven days of the week. And the uh, this is now seven days which are to be treated like Sabbath days in that uh, the only work you can do is to prepare food to eat. And, and you are setting this time aside to think about where God has brought you from. And that certainly um, is where the bitter herbs come in. You're remembering where you were and what God has delivered you from. And uh, we're eating, um, putting leaven out of our houses, again, symbolizing a cleansing of our whole environment from anything sinful, certainly from malice and wickedness and embracing sincerity and truth. And we are taking time. It's not just a five-minute thought, uh, you know, how people pray. Sometimes they'll thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, and off they go for the day. No, this is seven days. They're, they're feasting. They are resting. They are thinking. They are worshiping. They are thanking God uh, for this. And so, uh, I'm well aware of the Day of Atonement when they would fast and pray and pray for uh, forgiveness of sins. But but this particular feast was a memorial feast that spoke of their deliverance from Egypt and started the whole ball rolling toward their eventual forgiveness of sins when the Lamb of God was sacrificed on their behalf. So this took time. It took deliberate effort. It took put, putting everything else aside and really turning their heart and their attention toward God and what he had done for them. So um, in verse 17, you shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. So he's repeating in verse 17 what we read in verse 14. Um, this is to go on uh, throughout all your generations. 18 in the first month, 14th day of the month, at evening you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses, for whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. And then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside of his house until morning. So more detail and, and a repeating of the detail. And of course, with repetition, we get an idea of the importance of what is being stated. Uh, I am giving this feast to you. Observe it seven days. Don't, um, don't miss no unleavened bread, uh, no sin, uh, eating and remembering what God has done, remembering the bitter past. And then uh, specific to this particular situation, he said, tell the elders, get everybody together, let them get hyssop. Um, Psalm 51.7 speaks to us about hyssop. Psalm 51, of course, being this great psalm of repentance as far as uh, David's writing was concerned. And, and he's saying, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. So hyssop had this uh, 
this uh, function as a cleansing agent. And so, again, cleansing, purity is involved, and you take this hyssop, a sign of purity, and you put this blood around your door, doorposts and lintel and stay inside of your house until the morning. Why? Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. So uh, this, this, again, is, is a matter that God gives us instructions, and when we think of it from the standpoint of um, salvation and what we need to do, this is not something we make up and we go our own way and do our own thing. When we get to this in, in our New Testament study, hey, we do what God says we have to do. We don't make it up. We don't go our own way. We need to obey what God tells us. And this, uh, folks, was life and death. This wasn't a matter of, well, um, God doesn't really care um, as long as you have a good heart <laughs> and all of that. There are people who have all kinds of things to say. God isn't talking about, uh, you know, these Israelites are good and those Israelites are bad. So just the good ones, uh, just the bad ones need to do this. The good ones are okay. There are things that God lays out for everybody. Every family is to have a lamb. Uh, share a lamb if you need to, but everybody is to have what they should eat. And, and you need to take the blood, put it on your doorposts, um, eat unleavened bread, use the hyssop to apply the blood, eat the bitter herbs. All of this has to be in place. But certainly, uh, when the Lord goes through, if he does not see the blood on those doorposts and lintel, there will be death in that house. So just keep this in mind as we go forward to talk about salvation and what God has put in place for human redemption. It's not optional. It has nothing to do with are we good or bad people. In fact, a guy like Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Uh, it, it works for the worst, but it certainly works for the best. Mm -hmm. and, and whoever you are, you need to have this um, done and applied to you. So, uh, so that's, that's where we are as far as how to eat the feast and what to do as far as the blood is concerned. Any thoughts or questions? On that part. Okay, don't see anyone jumping in. Um, Galaxy S6 Edge Plus. Okay, that must be a fancy phone. So whoever you are, please go for it. I was thinking, um, could the blood on the door post symbolize either the faith that we have or the Holy Ghost? Well, it certainly symbolizes faith, <laughs> because if you didn't think that God was going to do what he said, and you thought, well, this is just Moses um, coming up with some silly thing, then you wouldn't do it. Um, so certainly, those who believed did what Moses instructed and were saved. So um, faith, absolutely. And and I, I'm, I don't think I would uh, speak of this as the Holy Spirit at this point. I think there's a very clear correlation between the blood, the application of the blood, and deliverance from death. Certainly, um, we, we will see the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, we've seen already in the life of, of Joseph, and we will see in the life of Moses, and then the 70 elders and all of that. But this, I think, is, is definitely uh, correlating to the blood and the blood of the lamb. And so 
when we think of this, we certainly think of terms that we use today quite frequently. Uh, now we go beyond the blood on the doorposts and we uh, use terms like uh, be washed in the blood of the lamb as we kind of correlate baptism with, with the uh, blood of Jesus, that saving uh, element and baptism being that sign of our entering in uh, into the name of Jesus Christ, into that saving name and that covenant relationship with him. So uh, the, the blood is certainly important as a symbol of, of our salvation. Okay. So we shall continue. Uh, of course, he he goes on in verse 20, 24 to repeat what he has said twice before in, in verse uh, 14 and verse 17. Verse 24 says, you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. So this, this is not three times in these few verses. He's saying the same thing over and over because this is so crucial. This is so significant, so important. Do not forget to do this. Um, when you enter the land that the Lord gives you, in verse 25, you'll observe this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our houses. And then in verse 29, uh, the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of uh, Egypt. Verse 30, Pharaoh uh, called Moses immediately, uh, verse 30, 31, and said, get out of here, just get out of here, take everything, take your flocks, your herds, and, and the end of verse 32, and bless me also, uh, which is <laughs> kind of a weird uh, request, I would say, but um, anyway, uh, that, that was Pharaoh's thing. Brother Dean, I see your hand up. The version I have, I think it's an international version, says permanent law as opposed to ordinance. Um, this is a very long question, maybe, but just, um, when do we consider the things permanent and when do we consider them um, temporal, as in a law that lasts for a period of time? We want to believe that God's laws are forever, Pastor, because I, I know that somebody recently tried to tell me that you couldn't possibly obey the Ten Commandments, which is 20, of course, Exodus 20. Is the law of God permanent? And like we don't practice um, these things that the Hebrews do or the Jews do. What, what should we consider in terms of permanent law or ordinances? Yeah, so we, we uh, first understand that what God says stands. Um, and, and this is what we we speak of as the old covenant or the first covenant as some uh, refer to it and and so that stood until such time and i i won't take time to try to find these scriptures just now but certainly we see that something significant happened when that uh, covenant ended and a new covenant began uh, at the death of Jesus Christ. And so part of what we know and understand of who Jesus is, is the fact that he is God in flesh. So when he died, the, the covenant that he had established ended and died with him. Well, when he rose again, well, and at his death, a new covenant was established. So when we think about what Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, about what we would call New Testament salvation, uh, a lot of that you will see outlined in 
in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to Matthew 7, and you'll hear him say, you have heard it said, ABC, but I say unto you, DEF. And, and so not only did he um, fulfill the law, which of course was his, his role uh, of, on behalf of all humanity to perfectly fulfill the law of God, then at his death, he established a new covenant. And even before his death, he started to make that transition to say, here's what you know now, here is what the, the future is going to um, entail as far as how, how you should live. So, um, yeah, so there is some work to do in that some, uh, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to think on my feet here. Um, there are some of these laws that come across, shall we say, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So if you talk about uh, a law like love your neighbor as yourself, that is, um, you can certainly dig this up, anyone who would like to uh, find it back in Deuteronomy, that's in Deuteronomy, but then Jesus brings that across into the New Covenant. Um, okay, you want to know what the the law is love the lord your god with all, the greatest commandment love the lord your god with all your heart mind soul and strength and the second is like unto it love your neighbor as yourself so you have it in the old covenant jesus brings it into the new covenant and so that's the kind of stuff that we would do in any law that we look at to say okay um has it been brought across by jesus and the apostles or did it culminate at the cross as far as the Old Covenant is concerned? So certainly when you look at something like the Passover, uh, we see that it was fulfilled in its entirety in Christ. And so after his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, the apostles certainly understood that that was over, and, and so there was no more sacrifice for sins, and Hebrews talks about that uh, also in detail. So some things come across, not everything. Most were fulfilled and, and encapsulated in Jesus, and we, we um, I guess I would say selectively, uh, have some that were brought across into the New Covenant. Okay, and thanks, Pastor Adrian, for those uh, um, references. That's that's good. Okay, so I don't see anything else, any other hands right now. So let's go forward into the Exodus itself. We're at Exodus twelve and thirty-three. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we will all be dead. That's a fair assumption. And so they just packed everything up. And again, it mentions in 35 that they requested from the Egyptians articles of uh, silver and gold and clothing. And in verse 36, thus they plundered the Egyptians. So this was, this was their payment for their years of slavery. And uh, then verse 37, now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and the thought process there is that it could be other nations who had been people of other nations who had been enslaved by Egypt. Another thought is that there were um, military mercenaries who had been hired by Egypt, and that was a common thing back in the day, and they kind of figured, you know what, um, Israel's the one 
that's winning. So we're going to go with the winner. And uh, so it doesn't give us uh, much detail. It could be that there was some level of intermarriage between Egyptians and Israelites. There, there are a number of possibilities, but it wasn't just Israelites, but there were others who were associated with them in some way, shape, or form. This mixed multitude went up along with flocks and herds, a large number of livestock. And uh, then uh, verse 40 says, now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Okay. Any thoughts and questions there? I'm uh, Pastor Adrian. Uh, Pastor, just a question on the 430 years. Do you have any thoughts on how that compares with God's revelation to Abraham in Genesis, back in, I think, Genesis 12, that uh, the children of Israel would be um, strangers for 400 years in a strange land? Yeah, so um, that's in Genesis 15. And he's in Genesis 15, uh, 13. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. And I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. And afterward, they will come out with many possessions. So. Uh, this is one of those, um, what should I say, um, items that that many have looked at and said, well, um, certainly we see a discrepancy between these a contradiction in Scripture. Genesis 15, speaking about um, 400 years, and uh, Exodus 12, speaking about 400 years. And 30 years. And in fact, if you get into the New Testament, you will see Acts chapter 7, verse 6, that, uh, that speaks of 400 years. And then Galatians 3, 16 and 17, that speaks of 430 years. And um, I've just put a little link up for you in the chat. Um, I will quickly go through this, but if you'd like to get into this in somewhat more detail, um, just before we kind of lose the chat uh, at the end of the lesson, you can just copy and paste that into your browser. And, and there's a, an article there that I think will be, will be very helpful. So um, to, to try to make it as succinct, as I can, first uh, point to understand is that God made a promise to Abraham. This was not a promise to uh, Israel when they just went into Egypt. This was a promise made to Abraham. And if you go all the way back to chapter 12 of Genesis, this was the first time uh, that, that God gave this covenant to Abraham, and you'll see that, guess what, uh, very shortly after that, likely a matter of, of months, uh, Abraham ends up in Egypt in fear of his life, because he thought, you know what, they're going to kill me on behalf of my wife, um, Sarah, or Sarai, at the, at the time. So, as far as where do we start the count, um, I, I think as we kind of do the math, we will probably need to go all the way back to Genesis 12, when Abram was 75 years old, and, and he got the covenant from God. Well, you go forward 25 years, 
and uh, Isaac was born, and now God had said, your descendants are going to be in, in slavery and going through this persecution for 400 years. And, and so the thought process is, well, you get to Genesis um, uh, 21, verse 9, and again, don't worry if you don't get all these scriptures down. You can certainly, as I say, just um, copy and paste the link I have referred you to and and if you'll take a little time uh, you can go through and and sort of work this out in your own mind so when in Genesis 21 9 you see that of course Ishmael had been born and now when Isaac the son of promise had come and was weaned which which is that time was typically viewed as five years um, you see that uh, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. So um, there's another scripture. Let me see if I just have a note of that quickly. That's Galatians. Yeah, Galatians 4.29 uh, refers to that also. Let me just quickly, Galatians 4.29, and it says, but at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So you have the word mocking being used in Genesis 21, 9. And then you have the word persecution being used in Galatians 4. Galatians 4, what verse did I read? Uh, 29. Okay. So, so you can. Uh, sort of take a look and say, well, Abraham or Abram got the promise in Genesis 12, and the persecution began of his descendants in Genesis 21. So 30 years had gone by, 25 years till Isaac was born, five years till he was weaned, and, and uh, Ishmael started to mock him and persecute him, right? So so if you're talking about the descendants of Abraham, uh, you will you see that starting in Genesis 21 and 9. So then from there, you, you uh, start to uh, add your, your time, which, which actually, as, I, um, as you go through it, there's a, a great chart, which is why I think it's good if you download this this particular uh, chart from the link I gave you it's it actually lays out a timeline that lays out the 430 years now one of the things that is pretty surprising um, oh there are a lot of things I, I think you'll you'll enjoy going through uh, through this so if we start the 430 years from the time Abraham got the promise, 30 years uh, brings us to the time that his descendant Isaac was being persecuted. And then it just tracks the other events that took place. Um, as I was going through this, it was pretty interesting that at, um, at the time uh, that Jacob, that Joseph was uh, sold into slavery, Isaac was still alive. He was 168 years old. So in Genesis 37, um, you, that, that time was, Joseph was 17, Isaac was still alive and died um, at 180 years old. And as you continue, you will, you'll see the way some of the math works out in that, uh, let's say, day zero, you know, when the the Israelites were now released to go to the promised land. If you start working back from that, uh, it was uh, 80 years before uh, eight, uh, Moses was 80 years old at the time that um, that Moses was 80 years old when Israel was released from Egypt. And then if you go back 
sort of starting from the start and adding up the years to when Joseph died. Joseph died, uh, believe it or not, just 144 years before the Exodus. And um, uh, the family, Jacob and his family, had come into Egypt uh, only 215 years before their deliverance. So I know most of the time we've just thought, oh, Israel was in Egypt 400 years, but the only way the math works is if we actually take it from the time that God gave the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 30 years later, the persecution of his descendant Isaac began, and 400 years from that, uh, uh, they were delivered. So I would encourage you to download that uh, article and go through it in detail. So the 400 years is speaking of the persecution from Isaac to their deliverance. The 430 years is speaking of the time between God's original covenant to Abram, the start of the persecution of his descendants in Genesis 12, plus 400 years. So it's 400 and it's 430. Now, I do not expect you to get all of that without doing a little reading, but um, one of the interesting things uh, certainly is that Israel wasn't actually in that Egyptian slavery for the 400 years. It was more like 215 years, and, and the, the um, persecution started with Isaac. Uh, in other words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all part of this 400-year uh, persecution thing, and then you add the 30 years from when uh, God actually gave the promise to the time that the persecution started with Ishmael persecuting Isaac. Now, let me stop for a minute <laughs> and see if anyone has any thoughts there. But again, it, 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 this will take you a little time, I would well imagine, to read through and, and kind of get this all sorted out in your mind. Um, are we okay, Pastor Adrian, um, or have I just muddied the waters completely? That is a that is a good perspective, Pastor. I'm sure as the folks look at look at it, they'll have a couple of questions. So let's let's give them the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, from the standpoint of of what I would like to accomplish tonight, I will leave this with you. Uh, uh, hopefully everyone has seen the link in the chat and it may well take you some time to work through uh, all of that. So if, um, again, I'm not expecting that you will just grab it all uh, this second, but as you go through it this week, if you have some questions or thoughts you'd like to bring up at the start of our lesson next week, please feel free to do that. But uh, I just put the link to this article because it's the most succinct um, summation that I found that I think gives a, a really good and detailed breakdown of, um, of the difference between uh, the times. Um, Rainford family. So, uh, sorry. so Pastor, verse 40 says, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt mm -hmm. 130 years. I have a little asterisk in my Bible against Egypt, and it says the Samaritan Pentateuch and mm -hmm. the Septuagint reads Egypt and Canaan. Is that related to your answer? Yeah, absolutely. And, and part of the thought process there is that even if you go back into Genesis 12, you will, you know, part of that argument is that uh, Abraham himself started to experience um, persecution in Egypt over Sarah way back when, just after he received the, um, 
uh, the promise, the covenant from God. So the the major point is that this um, this time doesn't just start with Egypt being uh, Israel being in Egypt uh, as far as the nation, because that really I th think if you go through the timelines in this article, you'll see it's two hundred and something years, whereas we're talking about four hundred or four hundred and 30 years. So again, this is the best um, and easy, most easily accessible explanation I, I can uh, give to you from, uh, from that, that's using scripture and not kind of using a bunch of other stuff <laughs> that is, is non-scriptural. But, but the whole point of it is that this actually starts with Abraham receiving the promise, not just starting when Israel became slaves in Egypt. So, so there are things like this written um, in, in chapter uh, 12 that, uh, that, again, depending on the translation and depending on, on the interpretation, uh, sometimes things are used as a summary statement, uh, just as an example, as we go through scripture, you start to see that, that when people are talking about the Ten Commandments, they often summarize it to speak of Sabbath keeping. It becomes a bit of a code to say, well, if you're keeping the Sabbath, you're keeping the commandments. And in similar fashion, it seems to be that, that Israel and Egypt, that was such a culmination and painful end to this time when they talk about Egypt, even though they're talking about Egypt and Canaan, they just summarize it in the, the um, slavery portion in Egypt for the last 215 years, roughly. Anybody else? Okay. So, as I say, take your time and, and read through that. Uh, Pastor Adrian. Uh, maybe maybe just, just uh, one thought as we're working through it this week is uh, this explanation, um, if you look at the genealogy of Moses beginning with Levi, Mm -hmm. um, the number of generations there squares uh, more with this explanation of a reduced number of years of the children of Israel in Egypt than 400 years. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have four um, generations spanning a very long period of about 400 <laughs> years. So yeah. just just, uh, you know, just as you're thinking about it, uh, that's that's useful to look at as well. Yeah, it's funny. I was reading that this week. And I thought, oh man, I, I had really never considered it before. Levi lived 137 years. You know, I was talking about this commercial break that we had when um, uh, Pharaoh chased Moses out of his presence and um, the people were after him and he went back to God and God sent him back to Moses and then whew, take a break. Well, in the middle of that commercial break, it's, it's breaking down. Um, Levi uh, had a son named Kohath. Kohath had a son named Amram. Amram had a son named Moses. So Levi lived 137 years. In that span, he had a son, Kohath, who lived 133 years. Then Kohath had a son named Amram that lived 137 years. But clearly, um, um, Levi didn't have Kohath when he was 137, and then Kohath had Amram when he was 133, and then Amram had Joseph when he was 137. In the, it doesn't give you all of these uh, time frames, but uh, I'll, I'll, as I say, I'll let you work through. When you see working forward from Abraham, you see that we get to to um, uh, Joseph dying uh, 144 years from deliverance. And then when you work backwards from their deliverance, 
and you take 80 years off that, um, you know, like Moses was 80 years old. So if, if Joseph died 144 years before deliverance and, and Moses was 80 years old, it shows that, that um, uh, Moses was born only 64 years after Joseph died. And so in that 64 years, you had Levi and, and um, where's my little, note? yeah, Levi and Kohath and Amram and Moses coming. So, so and now, so it would seem Kohath was born probably at some point uh, before, uh, you know, was part of the group that came into Egypt with, with Jacob. And, and so you, you have these three generations before Moses and quite likely born before they even, you know, starting to be born even before they came into uh, Egypt. And, and the distance between Joseph and Moses was only 64 years. So again, when you read a scripture like there arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph, well, okay, we're not talking about 400 years now, we're talking about only 64. Well, that still makes sense. Um, a lot of us don't remember a whole lot of history, even from 64 years ago. Um, you know what, that, that's like 1958 and, or, yeah, in, in the late 50s, early 60s. And yeah, there are things we know, but if I said who was the Prime Minister of Canada in 1960, I don't think many of us would know. I certainly don't. All right. Anything else on this before we continue? So chapter 12 is, well, we're not quite done yet, so let's finish chapter 12. We're at verse 42. It is a night to be observed for the Lord for having brought them out of the land of Egypt. This night is for the Lord to be observed um, by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. How many times has he told us that? I think the Lord wanted them to remember this, but to Brother Dean's question, um, there did actually come a point of, of the end, uh, and, and we will get to that when we talk about, about Jesus. Now, Brother Dean, I see you're unmuted. Uh, did you have a question? Oh, no, sorry, sir. I think that was a bad mistake of mine. But I believe it was Ethan Baker back in 1960. Hey, well, good for you. <laughs> but, you know, I, I know if I have an opportunity, I'm not too sure that the difference between 400 and 430 in terms of the pain and suffering, can, I don't know that somebody else's pain and suffering can be measured to begin with. It was definitely a long time. Yeah, uh, it, it's one of the things, though, that people look at to say, oh, you can't trust the Bible. They don't know the difference between 400 and 430 years. And, and so how can you trust the Bible if it can't even do its math in that regard? And, and so if we sort of start with that premise, well, um, who knows where we'll end up. But um, as this little article says, if we start from the premise that the Bible is inerrant, then, then let's um, do what is the honor of kings to search out a mystery, right? And, and see if we can uh, decipher what is actually going on. So, so we, we now have the instruction that anyone who wants to join Israel and, and be circumcised is welcome to join in in this uh, feasting and and uh, this uh, celebration of what God has done for Israel. In verse 49, the same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you. And uh, verse 51, on that same day, the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. So 
Um, it's good. I think we can squeeze chapter 13 in, um, but I will pause again for a moment if there's anything on your mind from chapter 12. Uh, as you can see, we uh, there was a lot of ground to cover in that chapter. The um, Passover, the the uh, final plague, the exodus, and and the fact that anybody who desires has an entrance into the the wonders and the deliverance of the Passover uh, through the covenant of circumcision. So that was a lot of stuff to cover in that chapter. So if we're good, then we will try to squeeze chapter 13 in, uh, where the Lord uh, said to Moses, sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast. It belongs to me. And uh, so this, this becomes now something that, that was very, he, he continues on through the, the chapter. Let, let's jump down to verse 11. Now, when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers and gives it to you, you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. So now, more than just this annual Passover sacrifice, now the Lord is taking it a step further to say, listen, when I bless you with offspring or I bless your herd with offspring, the firstborn male belongs to me. And, and uh, on a personal note, that certainly was something my mother believed in. And so when I was born, it's like, Lord, this one is yours. And, well, that's the way it has been since day one. And, and so if it was a particular animal, it should be redeemed. Uh, you could pay a price to save the life of that animal and, and keep from killing it. But a payment had to be made to uh, you know to redeem or pay for the life of the fruit of the womb if it wasn't to die. When you get into, uh, I think it's the book of Numbers, we have some details of what uh, the payments would be for for this these firstborn. I I didn't just go there. I won't refer you to it just now, but but there were payments to be made or an animal to be sacrificed, whatever the case may be. But the point he was making there is that uh, is that the firstborn, just remember what I did at the Passover. It was uh, the firstborn in Egypt that died, and as they died, it, it, it was a judgment of God. Now I want you to give me your firstborn as a sign of your appreciation for their life. And they, the firstborn, belongs to me. And I encourage parents. Um, and now, the whole male-female thing comes into play here. And, and I know there are folks who try to be very gender-inclusive as far as scripture is concerned. In this case, I, I think it is very clear uh, the Lord was speaking of males uh, as it was with the Passover lamb and as God represented himself to humanity as a male, I, I think we, we have to keep it to that and not try to uh, spread it beyond what, what scripture gives us. And um, when we get into another discussion, another time, even to this day, <clears throat> coming out of Ephesians chapter uh, 5 as an example, or 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
as a, another example, God has given certain roles and responsibilities that are gender specific and, and uh, authorities and responsibilities that he has given in, in a gender specific way. But men uh, being male and Christ being male, there is a symbolism there and there is an understanding of how men in particular are to live as the representatives of Christ. And I even think of this scripture that we probably should highlight a lot more that uh, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, and women likewise, uh, that they, they have a demeanor of, of a meek and quiet spirit, uh, which is in the sight of God of, of great value. So there are times that God speaks of the role he wants each gender to play, but men, Ephesians uh, 5 talks about uh, men loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so there is a role, there's a privilege, there's a responsibility of manhood. And, and I, I, I don't think we need to step back from that in any way to, to try to make everything gender neutral. God has given ma males a particular role, a particular responsibility, and a particular privilege as representatives of Christ in their home. And I think that is something men should certainly give thanks for and strive to, um, uh, to uh, emulate Christ in this self-giving way. Um, so so uh, to Brother Dean's question, were the males sacrificed in Egypt? Uh, they weren't sacrificed. They were um, any male, uh, firstborn male coming out of the womb was to be redeemed. The Lord said, no, I'm not interested in you um, killing them, but the, the point is they belong to me, and so and, and you won't kill them physically, but you will symbolically uh, purchase their redemption or uh, their things you could offer as sacrifices to God, uh, and you, you have the kind of thing like um, uh, Hannah bringing Samuel to say, okay, I prayed for this child. He's my firstborn male, he I give to the Lord. And, and um, so that, that I think is uh, an honor and a privilege, certainly that I take very seriously to, to say um, men need to represent Christ and especially firstborn males need to be very conscious of the fact that from this day they were given to God and need to take that place and privilege very seriously. Uh, Brother Dean. No, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Okay. No, I was talking about back in Egypt when, when Pharaoh, when, yeah, never mind. Yeah, it's, it's a difference between judgment and offering to God. The firstborn dying in Egypt was judgment firstborn being offered to God, uh, you know, takes us back in our mind to the judgment of Egypt and brings us now into the concept of the firstborn belonging to God. And if you are firstborn online or listening later on, step up to your privilege. You represent Christ. All right. Anybody else? So uh, that is the main uh, thought of chapter 13. And then, of course, we have one other thing that uh, starts in verse 17. Exodus 13, 17. Of course, when Pharaoh had let the people go, um, uh, it says God didn't lead them by the way of the Philistines, which would have been a short 
route, but he said, you know, they'll see war and um, change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them the long way by the wilderness to the Red Sea. And of course, in verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him as they had sworn to do. And, and then in verse 21 and 22, you see another miracle beginning. And the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now, that's pretty amazing. Now, number one, um, again, for those who have been in the Middle East and you know what these desert conditions are like, you can imagine uh, if, if it's talking about, uh, what did we say, 700,000 men, to say nothing of uh, women, children, uh, livestock, this was a massive group of people. And the desert is hot. God gave them air-conditioned comfort all day, covered them with a cloud. All around, the sun was blazing down, but for them, they were covered by the cloud. And again, because it's desert and there's nothing to hold the heat in when the sun goes down, uh, all the heat just evaporates out of the ground and it gets cold, quite cold. Uh, and we were at um, Mount Sinai and they said, you know, if you want to go up, uh, we'll be heading out. I think it was like 3.30 in the morning. And man, you better have had uh, a, a jacket, something warm, because you get up at that time of the night, it is freezing. So what did God do? Turn the furnace on. He had the pillar of fire by night. Uh, they could travel by day or by night, or as we will get to later, when the, the cloud didn't move, they didn't move. When the fire didn't move, they didn't move. When they moved, the people moved. And, and so not only was it uh, keeping them in very comfortable temperatures. It also was the way that God led them. They would simply follow the cloud, follow the fire. They could travel by day or night, or they could sit still as the Lord gave them rest at various points. And so another miraculous intervention from God began at this point with the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And so that's all. Uh, that's chapter 13. That's all we will cover uh, today. We'll go into chapter 14 next week. So we have some time if there are some final comments or questions that you may have. And again, as I mentioned at the start, uh, just look at the very first chat. I just want to remind you that starting with the uh, first Monday in October, we will be having a new login ID. So please just um, go up to the, if, if you are one who wants to log in with that ID, you can, you can record that number. Uh, if you just want to go to the website and the Faith Sanctuary website, you just hit the uh, Berean Bible study, click here, and it will bring you right in. So if you're using, uh, I don't know what code you might be using now, but that one will expire at the end of September and starting on the first um, Monday in October, uh, just go to the website, click in to the Berean prayer meeting, or uh, if you set yourself up another way, you, you have the login ID. Uh, here in the first chat. And certainly you can do some homework on the 400, 430 years, uh, etc. That's a neat article you can read. And yeah, so anything else you have on your mind? I am waiting with bated breath for your comments or questions. Brother Finlater. 
Yes, Pastor, um, in chapter 12 and verse 5, where Moses were, was um, asked to present an unblemished lamb from a, from a sheep or from a goat, mm -hmm. is there any significance of these two animals? Why um, other animals could have been chosen? Yeah, um, uh, later on, uh, obviously, we, we see, you see sheep, you see goats, you see oxen, and you see turtle doves and you know, pigeons, whatever. So um, I think God just chose them as certainly animals that you see quite frequently in the, uh, as far as what would be plentiful and uh, animals that were, were very much used at that uh, time. And so... I, um, in, in that day, they used the term lamb uh, to, to refer to sheep or goats. And so when we think of lamb today, we think of sheep, but the term in scripture here is used to refer to sheep or goats. It, it was something definitely of value, but uh, the the sheep or the lamb wasn't of the same value, let's say, as as a cow. Uh, so so it was something that people could uh, could access. Yes, it would be a sacrifice, but it was a doable sacrifice. But uh, beyond that, I I don't I I don't uh, know specifically why the Lord chose those, other than to say they were readily available and plentiful. Okay. The reason we're asking that also is because in the New Testament, um, the if you're referred to a sheep, yep. it's for those who are saved and yep. the, the goat, those are lost. That's the reason why I'm asking the, yeah. the significance um, for those two choices. So we sort of take it as where we are in scripture at this time. And at this time, there, uh, both the offspring of sheep and goats were were viewed as being uh, acceptable. When we go later into the sacrificial system, we will run into the term the scapegoat, and and that's uh, a goat you know, who's you know, you'd sort of confess the sins of the people, uh, lay your hands on the head of this goat, then take it out into the wilderness. To, to bear the sins of the people and the other goat would be sacrificed. Uh, so even in the Old Testament, there came a point where goats really uh, were, were the sin bearers. But at this point in time, where we are line upon line, precept upon precept and all of that, okay. at this point, sheep and goats were acceptable for this particular situation. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay. So, if that is it, folks, I I don't see anyone else just yet, so or right now, so I will very much look forward to meeting with you next week if the Lord tarries, and uh, we will see you then, and God be with you.